Welcome back to Physics with Mr. McQuarrie, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about everyday forces. And this is just a clever way to lump in some of those forces that we've talked about a little bit and go into some more detail about it. Now, I would absolutely be remiss if we didn't have some sort of Star Wars reference for unit on forces. The so next time you're watching The Mandalorian, or Clone Wars, or Rogue One, or heck, even the original movies of a new trilogy, and you hear that phrase, Luke, use the force. Maybe think of Luke, use the mass times acceleration instead. Or not. It's completely up to you. Now, over the course of this unit, we've talked about applying Newton's laws to situations. And sometimes it can be, you know, easy to forget those over the course of a unit. So let's just do a quick review. Um, a force producing another force with equal magnitude in the opposite direction. Sounds a lot like equal and opposite, right? Third law. An object with no force acting on it remains at rest. An object in motion remains in motion at constant velocity. And we could even add, unless acted upon by an outside unbalanced force. Sounds like the law of inertia, AKA uh, law number one, right? And that leaves us with just one, that the net force equals mass times the net acceleration. So we're dealing with the second law, all right? So the second law, speaking of, uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into how to use that equation. So the net force, or the sum of all the forces, is equal to the mass times the net acceleration on an object. And that allows us to confidently say that force and acceleration have a direct correlation between each other. All right, and so when we tell you guys that when there's a force, there has to be an acceleration involved and vice versa, this is why, because of Newton's second law, okay? And some students prefer the triangle method. If we ask you to solve for F or M or A, for example, um, instead of isolating those variables through algebra, some people enjoy using the triangle method where you can kind of cover up the thing you're solving for and then see what you're left with. And if the things are above each other, you divide. And if they're next to each other, um, then you multiply. So some people really enjoy that. Um, regardless if you use the triangle method or if you're using an algebraic method, your units are still going to be the same. Um, you're going to use newtons when it comes to force, meters per second when it comes to acceleration, and kilograms. Let's make that very clear. Kilograms when you're dealing with mass. Do not use grams. Your numbers are going to be off. All right. The SI standard unit is kilograms, and it can be easy to forget that sometimes in the midst of an exam. Couple practice problems here to use this formula. Um, number one, we're still gonna pull out our given information. So the two kilograms for the mass of the book is still important. And the net force of the book of one Newton is also important. So we will go ahead and pull those out as our given information. The unknown thing we're trying to solve for is asking for the book's acceleration. And the good news for us is that there is only one equation we have to use um, for this entire unit on forces, and that is Newton's second law, F equals MA. And from this point right here, it's an algebra problem. You can plug things in and solve. So we'll plug in our force, we'll plug in our mass. Solving for acceleration, we get one half meter per second squared. The thing that I see most often with students is usually an algebra problem at the very end. For example, um, for some reason, Sometimes people want to subtract that two kilograms and think that will get them, you know, acceleration on its side by itself. Or some people erroneously believe that you will take um, two divided by one and that will somehow um, give you your answer. So, you know, my suggestion for students is when you get to the end of a problem like this with any physics problem, do it a couple times, especially on an exam, because you'd hate to go through all this work of setting up your problem only to have an algebra mistake on the final part of it. Another example over here, solving for another variable. Um, we have a book that's going across the table, which is much larger than our last book. Same acceleration, though. Um, so our given information will be the five kilograms of the book and the one half meter per second squared for acceleration. This time we're solving for force, though. So we can go ahead and plug things right into our equation. There's no manipulation involved. You're just going to multiply those together to get two and a half newtons of force. 
Okay, so we did an example where we solved for acceleration, another one we solved for force, and we might just ask you later to solve for mass. Just be prepared for that. When we deal with forces, the unit we use is the Newton. Just like we use kilograms for mass, just like we use seconds for time, it's just another unit. Now, when you're checking problems to see if they're reasonable or not, it can be helpful to know just how much Newton is. A Newton is about the weight of an apple. So if you get a problem and it asks you to find the mass of a paperclip, or what to say, even better yet, I stand corrected, the weight of a paperclip, and you get something like 500 Newtons for that paperclip, you know something's up because that is a really big paperclip if it's about 500 apples. All right, so just be careful with that and use that to help you determine if something is reasonable or not. When it comes to measuring the force of gravity, it's the same thing as finding the weight. All right, they are one and the same, just a different way of saying the same idea. Luckily for us, we're still going to use that Newton's second law equation, force equals mass times acceleration. The only difference is that this time the acceleration is going to be given to us when we're on Earth. It's always going to be 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, obviously, if you go to different planets, um, you would have a different acceleration due to gravity. But on Earth, it'll always be 9.8. So it's actually an easier version of the problems we've already done. Sometimes my students get mixed up between mass and weight, and it's easy to do. Mass is how much stuff is in something, how much matter is in it. Whereas weight is the actual force of gravity pulling on you towards another object. Usually it's the Earth. Because there's a direction involved, there is weight is definitely a vector. It is a force. It's measured in Newtons. Whereas mass, where it's just an amount, with no direction means it must be a scalar quality and it's not a force. When you're looking through problems, it can be easy to pick these out, especially if you see the units involved. All right, someone gives you something in kilograms, you can say right away it's gonna be mass. Or if something gives you, um, in terms of Newtons, it's gonna be a force and it might just be weight. So sometimes looking at those units can really help you break apart a problem to determine what that variable stands for. Here's my pet hamster, Gomer. All right, Gomer has a mass of about 15 hundredths of a kilogram. And we're gonna be figuring out how much he weighs, okay? So first things first, let's write our givens. At first, it might appear that there's only one thing we are given, just the mass, right? But remember, we're on Earth, and so we know the acceleration due to gravity. 9.8 meters per second squared. We're gonna be solving for the weight aka the force of gravity, which will be F. And there's only one equation we have for that, F equals MA. We have M, we have A, we can plug those right in. And we know that Gomer is about one and a half Newtons in weight. So he's about one and a half apples. And if you've dealt with hamsters before, and you've actually held one, you can probably back that up, but that sounds pretty legitimate. All right, so Gomer is a little over an apple in weight. Quick question here. Is it your mass, your inertia, your weight, or your acceleration that's the gravitational force between you and the Earth? This is back to, you know, maybe considering mass versus weight, for example. Weight is a force, mass is not. And so since they're asking for force, weight is the only one that's a force of these four. So it's gotta be weight. Sometimes my students ask me, well, I don't have a formula for normal force. How do I solve for that? Because we will ask you those. Well, there isn't one because it's the same equation that we've used this entire unit, F equals MA. And for our intents and purposes for this particular square, it will be the same as weight, all right? And I know that's not the case for every other year. Other years, we have things that act on inclined planes, um, where you have to include geometry and trigonometry to help your answer out. Um, and you will weigh different amounts depending on the slope that you're on. But for this particular year, we're only going to be dealing with things that are on flat surfaces. And so it will be equal in magnitude to your weight. Different direction, but equal magnitude. So let's just say we have a 14-kilogram uh, turkey here. 
Um, and fun fact, that's actually doubled in the last 50 years or so. Turkeys used to be a lot smaller, and uh, we've bred them to be bigger and bigger, so we can eat more and more on Thanksgiving. We want to figure out what is the normal force exerted by the flat surface on the turkey. So it should say the surface on the turkey, but we know that they're going to be equal and opposite. So it'll be the same magnitude, right? We have the mass of 14. We know acceleration is 9.8. So the normal force of the turkey is going to be 137 newtons. So it would be the surface on the turkey pushing up on it 137 newtons. So we could, we could do some different wording on this PowerPoint. All right. It'll also be the same as the weight, correct? This different direction. When it comes to acceleration, when things work together, velocity and acceleration, it usually helps the object speed up. It adds the speed. If they're working against each other, then they're going to slow down. Think of it as you're running a race and your velocity is going in a certain direction. When the wind is at your back, providing an outside force, you're going to speed up. You're able to run a little faster, right? But if you're running into the wind, it's going to slow you down. This is the same principle right here for acceleration and velocity. If you don't like that example, think of it as um, you're in a current. Maybe you're, uh, maybe you're in a boat and you're trying to paddle that boat. When the current is at your back, you can go much faster. You're going to continuously speed up. But if that current is working against you, then you're going to slow down. So in short, acceleration and velocity work together, you're going to speed up. If it works against each other, then you're going to slow down. And eventually, you might even go back the other direction, right? Look at this guy over here. He's pushing on this box, okay? Right now, there is no net force. All of our vec force vectors cancel out. So that box is not going to accelerate. If it's already in motion, it will continue at that same rate. If it's not moving, it's not going to all of a sudden start moving. Okay, so no net force, no acceleration. But let's just say that this guy here moving the box decides to put a little more oomph in it. And now he does have a net force. One of those vectors is larger, so not all of that will cancel out. Since there's a net force, there should be a net acceleration. So that box will accelerate to the right. If it's already moving, it'll increase speed. And if it's not moving, it will start to move and increase speed. Let's do a problem over here that's Newton's third law disguised. Joe and Nigel are playing tug of war. Let's say Joe's on the right in a striped shirt. Let's say Nigel's on the right in the khaki. And Joe's a little smaller. When they're pulling on it in opposite directions, Joe is being accelerated at one and a half meters per second to the right. And we're tasked with finding the net force that he's being pulled with. So let's, let's go ahead and break this down a little bit. The given information is that Joe is accelerated at one and a half meter per second squared and that Joe's mass is 80 kilograms. We will go ahead and record that and we're going to solve net force. The only equation we've been given this whole time is that F equals MA. So we plug in M or A. We solve for F, the force, and it is 120 newtons of magnitude that Joe is pulling with. Okay, now Newton's third law says that the force that Joe pulls with is the same force that Nigel's experiencing. So let's flip this and say, okay, well, if Nigel's also applying that same force, then what's his acceleration? Because he's a little bigger. All right, well, we're still given the force of 120 newtons. We're still given Nigel's mass of 90 kilograms. Let's solve for acceleration, okay? Still going to use F equals MA. We can have the F, we have the M, we will solve for A with a little bit of algebra, and we see that the acceleration is one and a quarter meters per second squared. So because Nigel's a little larger, he's not going to accelerate as much as Joe. And with that, that's it, guys. Today we were able to break down some everyday forces using net force, Newton's second law, the effect of acceleration on velocity and vice versa, and kind of wrapped up our unit today on forces in general. Until next time, see ya.